anger and confusion at that little excerpt that they released. Um, so I, I, you were talking about what sort of rules might govern men and women working together in the workplace and, and a number of related issues. So I wanted to ask you about that interview, uh, what happened in that interview and what happened in that exchange and maybe give some context to uh, you know, what was going on in that particular exchange that, that, that some of us saw. Well, I think what happened in the interview is what's happening as the traditional media fall to their knees and perish which is happening at an extraordinary rate. You saw that Canadian newspapers have gone cap in hand to the federal government for, for subsidy. You know that CBC has 145,000 YouTube subscribers. I don't remember what their yearly budget is, but it's, it's in the, if I remember correctly, it's a billion dollars, but that might be wrong. But it doesn't matter. It's a lot. And all they've managed to generate on YouTube is 145,000 subscribers. It's like, which is absolutely abject, 100% catastrophic failure. <laughs> so, and I think there's a bunch of reasons for that. I mean, one of them is that there is a technological transformation occurring, right? Because one of the things about YouTube offers everything that TV offers and a bunch of things it doesn't offer. So it's going to win. It's clearly winning already. And so, and then I think that what's happening as the classic broadcast media starts to spiral is their good people start to leave. It's a credo distribution issue. The good people start to leave because they can. And then those that remain are less competent, and they get more desperate, and they broadcast more and more opinionated and polarized pieces to attract the remaining audience as they spiral towards zero. And so, well, I've really, seen this happen in large companies. I, I know how it works, and that's how it works. And so, I think the Vice interview was part of that, and the, the, and there, there's there's other things that are feeding into that. Like I think. And maybe this is also a consequence of the broadcast medium, is that because broadcast television had a very narrow time frame, you had to cram complex things into small periods of time, so there was a very pronounced tendency for journalists to do all the interpretation. And then that turned into a pronounced tendency for journalists to describe what they thought and what the news was, right? So that they were now the, the news. But as, I started noticing this about 25 years ago, when, you know, the news would show a politician talking, but the newscaster would be saying what the person said. It's like, well, why have the politician there at all? You might as well just have the newscaster. And that's when I stopped watching television news. And that was really like about 25 years ago. The Vice interview was was that sort of taken to its extreme. It was like he had an he had an idea of what the situation was, and he was doing. He wasn't as aggressive about it as Kathy Newman, but, um, <laughs> but it was the same sort of thing. It was like he was going to catch me out one way or another. And uh, that happened for about two hours, and he had kind of a supercilious attitude, um, which is not uncommon among, let's say, New York journalists. And, you know, and we talked for about two hours, and I said something that was provocative, I would say. What was, I said, well, we don't know what the rules governing men and women's behavior, sexual behavior in the workplace should be. I said, well, let's take makeup and high heels for an example. So maybe they shouldn't be allowed. I didn't say they shouldn't be allowed. I said, maybe they shouldn't be allowed. That's actually what you do when you try to think about something. <laughs> people, don't like, people don't like to think about things. Like, I've really noticed this in my clinical practice. So like, let's say I'm dealing with someone. And I might say, well, let's think of some options for your future. And for, they're really nervous, like right away. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, well, relax. We can talk about a bunch of things, and that doesn't mean they have to happen. Because that's what thinking is like. It's like, you talk about things, and they don't have to happen. But it's not easy for people to make that leap, because they get all nervous. They say, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that. It's like, relax. We'll, we'll make a rule. We're going to talk about 10 things today that might happen, and none of them are going to happen. And then people can finally have a bit of courage and maybe think. And what you do when you think is you throw out an idea, and you, then you think about it. And I thought, well, you know, it's been common practice. Men wear uniforms at work. They wear suits. A suit's a derivation of a military uniform. Why do men wear suits? So they're all the same. Why should they be all the same? So that unnecessary individual variability doesn't interfere with the functionality of the business. 
Now, you can argue about that. You might say, well, you don't want to make everyone wear the same damn suit because you, you, know, you get rid of all the creativity. Fair enough, that's a reasonable argument, but that's why the uniform, the suit, evolved. And so if you wear a suit and I wear a suit, we go to a business meeting, then the first thing we can figure out is, well, you're at least playing the same game I am enough so that you're wearing a suit. And it's like, that's not everything, but it's not nothing, right? And so, well, and when the Maoists, you know, when the Maoists made their advances in China, men and women wore the same uniform. Why? Well, it was for the same reason. It was to eliminate unnecessary individual variability. Well, if you don't want sexual behavior at work, first of all, you've got to decide that. Do you not want sexual behavior at work? Because the answer to that might not be, we don't want sexual behavior at work. You want to live, you want to work in an environment where romantic entanglements are essentially illegal. That's what NBC has done, right? That's their new policy, is like, if, there are, if you work at NBC and you know of co-workers who are having a romantic engagement with another co-worker, you're obligated to report them to HR. It's like, well, you might say, no affairs at work. It's like, okay, you want to put an informer culture in place to impose that, do you? Well, maybe you do, but maybe you should think about it, because the cure might be worse than the disease. It's like, well, like the evolutionary psychology and biology of makeup and high heels is crystal clear. I mean, people disputed that. It's like, well, read the goddamn literature, morons. <laughs> I mean, you get so sick of this. It's like, these aren't opinions that I'm just trotting out. You know, why do women wear rouge? It's to make the cheeks look like fruit. That's why. We're derived from fruit, fruit-eating primates. We have color vision. It's trichromatic. We pick out fruit. It's ripeness. That's what lipstick does. It also indicates a sexual flush. If you don't like that, well, tough luck for you. That's what it is. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, and it indicates youth as well, a youthful glow, but that's also associated with sexual attractiveness, because that's one of the prime determinants of sexual attractiveness for women among men. So, now I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen at work. And then high heels. Okay, why do you wear high heels? Well, it's because it, 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 it tilts your hips so that you're... So <laughs> Is that acceptable at work? Well, of course. It's like, no, not of course. Not of course. Perhaps. But we can't have a serious discussion about what's acceptable at work and what isn't because we're too damn immature to have the discussion. We can't even throw things out on the table like that. It's like, I don't know what the rules should be. At my workplace, at the university, I've been warned innumerable times not to have a discussion with a student, male or female, but it's the females that are of concern in this particular rule with the door shut. And that's, that's not like six months ago. That's not like three months ago. That's like advice from the last 15 years. Now, I don't listen to that because I think, sorry, I'm not living that way. But these things are tense. They're tense. And we won't talk about them intelligently and maturely. You know, I've also been accused three times in my career of sexual impropriety. Baseless accusations. And the last one really tangled me up for a whole year. It's not entertaining. So there's plenty to be sorted out, but like I said already, we live in the delusion of a 13-year-old adolescent girl. And so as long as we maintain that level of sophistication, we're not going to have a real conversation about what rules should govern men and women in the workplace. So you can't even open the damn discussion without being jumped on by uh, you know, a, a ray of like rabid harpies. So, <laughs> so that, in the Vice interview, it's like, it's no bloody wonder the media is dying. They're doing everything they possibly can to cut their throats and bleed out as fast as they possibly can. <laughs> you know, I read a bunch of the comments on the Vice interview, and some of them were irritated at me about the makeup and the high heel thing. It's like, oh, whatever. I knew that that, I knew perfectly well when I said that. I thought, oh yeah. I'll say this and it's the only goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it shows how predictable it was. But, um, but most of the comments that I've read so far have been, look, vice guys, we know what you're up to and we're pretty much sick of it. And I know that people like Ben Shapiro, he won't appear now if it isn't live. And that's a pretty damn reason. Like, see, I was sure. One of the things that really shocked me about Channel 4 in Britain, that was the Kathy Newman thing. So I walked into that after 
I had a busy morning doing some other things at the studio there. I walked into that and we met Kathy in the green room and she was getting all steamed and primped up and um, before she went on the camera. And, <laughs> They're surrounded by bees. <laughs> they move the hair and they put them. So it's quite comical to watch. And so, anyways, we went out in front of the cameras and we were having a perfectly friendly discussion. You know, she was all chipper and extroverted and, and uh, having a fine time. And then we sat down and we chatted for two minutes and then the cameras went on. It was like, different person. I thought, oh, I see. I see what's going on here. So, but it's this, it's this. It's a defunct mode of communication, I think. And people are gravitating towards YouTube because it's rough and ready. It's like, this is why Joe Rogan works. It's like, Joe's not all made up. He's, uh, you know, he's, like, he's like the rear end of a smashed up truck. <laughs> Here's the damn discussion, and there's three hours of it. If you want to listen, listen, and if you don't, then go to hell. <laughs> basically, and I like that about YouTube. You know, it's, it's it's also something that's so cool about YouTube too. Is you hear this idea that like young people have these short attention spans. It's like yeah, except when it comes to three hour long podcasts. <laughs> so it's very cool to see the shift. But a lot of it is that it's a death spiral. And I think a lot of the polarization in our society is actually a secondary consequence of the death spiral. It's like because the journalists are more and more desperate, and so they're just generating clickbait. And that's polarizing us. And hopefully that will stop when they die. <laughs> Lots of journalists would be pretty good to me. And I, I don't want to see the high quality journalists disappear. But I don't think the high quality journalists will disappear because I think their message could, could move across mediums. But I mean, when I see CBC, I got to watch CBC struggle on YouTube. It's so comical. It's just, it's just absurd. It's like, so I saw something that CBC put on YouTube that was 10 minutes long and I wanted to watch it. And so I sat down and watched it and I clicked. And, were three 30 second ads. And I thought, that's a lot of ads <laughs> for, for 10 minutes of your damn content. You really think I should pay a minute and a half of my time to watch 10 minutes of your content? Then I couldn't click through the ads. It's like, so rule number one, one ad, 15 seconds long, you can click through it in four seconds. That's the rule, not three 30 second ads that you have to sit through. It's like, have a little respect for the medium. It's like, no, no respect for me. <laughs> then the com comments were um, not allowed, disallowed. It's like, no, you don't need to do that because your viewers actually get to make comments. And if you can't hire someone to vet them, you could just leave the damn comments alone. That would be one thing, just let them happen. You know, maybe you need someone to weed out the ones that are like so wretched that, you know, any idiot could tell that, you know, it's a what would you call it, some demented troll who has nothing better than you know, But maybe you could just leave them alone. So they won't pay any attention to the media. And so I look at that and I think, it's no bloody wonder you guys can't get any traction. You've got no respect for the media whatsoever. You're not gonna make the transition. So I'm irritated at CTC and that's kind of a good reason too. And that's sort of, I guess, coloring my attitude towards the media in general, but they're in serious trouble. So. So Vice was a perfect example of that. It's like, you talk for two hours, what do they do? Well, they take the most contentious part of it just to show how damn smart they are. They don't think the people who are watching can see through it, which they could. It's like, to hell with you guys. It's like, that's so cheap and wretched that it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. All you're doing is making things worse. In, 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 in Lindsay Shepard's situation, she was smart to record her own side just as insurance from sort of dishonesty from the other side. Yeah, well, that's another thing that, that I've often thought about, is just to record the whole interview, you know, but I'm more or less willing at the moment to let the chips fall where they will. And most of the time, you know, most of the time, 
There are many people with whom I've sat down and had discussions where things were played straight, and I would say it's actually the majority of them. But there is a pretty pernicious minority that does what vice did. It's like, there's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for it. It's like, you've got no principles. Let's make this salacious. It's like, these things are important, the morons. It's like, get it together. Don't muck about like that. What the hell do you think you're doing? Well, we need to fix. It's like, up yours. <laughs> Seriously, it's so pathetic. It's so pathetic. You can't do it on content, so you'll do it on manipulation. That's, there's the motif for your life. I can't do it on content, so I'll do it on manipulation. The motto of vice. <laughs>